Good morning, uh, CCC. I want to uh, invite you in for our service, our virtual service today. Hopefully we're going to have this all pulled together and um, be able to spend some time worshiping together and studying your, the Word of God this morning. And uh, we just really want to invite everybody in. Um, if you're visiting, um, this is an interesting time to be a visitor at any place, but uh, we want to welcome you into this time of worship that we've put together and um, songs and prayer and uh, just an opportunity to hear God's word as Pastor Dave preaches today. So I want to thank you for coming and just invite you into uh, this time of worship together. Oh, my 
soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. Worship your holy name. I worship your holy name. God, we were, will worship your holy name, Lord. We will worship it every single day, God. worth more I will never come close no thing can compare cause you're our living hope your presence I've tasted Sing of the sweetest of loves that my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome here Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for To be overcome by your presence Nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. Cause you're our living home. Your presence. Tasted and seen that the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence, Lord. Oh, holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence. Oh, Lord. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience 
glory of your goodness let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness Sunday morning. Help us focus our minds and our hearts and our eyes completely on you and how great you truly are and how amazing you are to us, God. See 
got now to just transition lord we ask for your uh, guidance in this we ask for your um that your word would just be very clear um that you would speak to us through pastor david as he preaches and uh, shares with us the things that he's been studying from your word and that uh, lord that you would work in each one of our homes, the places that we're um, watching from or participating from, that it would not be a distraction um, to be in our own places, but that we would be able to just uh, focus on your word and what you have to say today to us. We ask for your blessing on this and on the time that we spend together. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we have some announcements um, today. That's kind of an interesting uh, concept to uh, make some announcements here from my home. Uh, but uh, one of the things that uh, we have in front of us, as many of you have probably already received your um, stimulus money that's been uh, deposited in your accounts uh, from the federal government. And we're just uh, asking that you think about tithing on that. Uh, that being something that's a first fruit coming um, from uh, just a real kind of a gift in reality. Um, we'd ask that you think about doing that and that the church then would be able to meet needs uh, with those monies that present themselves in this, um, in this time. Uh, another thing that we've got coming up is um, we've already done one drive-in church. Uh, and we're going to try to do that again on uh, the first Sundays of the month. So this next one will be in May, that first Sunday in May. So um, if you want to participate in a drive-in situation, um, not a drive-by, uh, drive-in and uh, be involved with that, um, you can be doing that in the first Sunday in May. Then the other thing that we're going to try to also um, coordinate for that uh, drive-in service is a communion time. And um, communion isn't um, something that should be just, um, you know, um, glossed over. Um, we want to really 
think about what that means to be partaking in the body and the blood of our Savior Jesus Christ. But um, I want to also encourage you, uh, the spiritual leaders in your home, um, you can be doing communion with your family um, anytime, really. And that would be actually really a kind of a special opportunity to um, be a spiritual leader in your home and um, provide that for your family. So we'll be trying to do it as a as a church body uh, on those uh, first Sunday, the drive-in church opportunity. But uh, I'd encourage you also to do it um, on a regular basis in your homes now. Thank you. Well, good morning, CCC family, friends. Pastor David here, and we are back in Ephesians. We're second week back into Ephesians. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Turn to, Jesus, <laughs> turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, we are in our series called Brought to Life and Brought Together. If you remember the uh, summary of Ephesians can be described this way. It's chapters 1 through 3 describe what God has done in us, what God has done in us. And chapters 4 through 6 describe Paul's call for us to work out or to live out what God has done in us. What Paul calls walking worthy of the gospel to which you've been called. And so, so far in chapter 4, we have seen in verses 1 through 16... Uh, walking worthy of the gospel is walking in unity as the church. And in verses 17 through 25, or actually 17 through 32, is what we're looking at. Presently, the theme there is walking worthy uh, in a life of holiness. Walking worthy in a life of holiness. 17 through 32 can be broken down even farther. Verses 17 through 24 give the foundation for living a holy life, while verses 25 through 32 apply that truth, the truth of the foundation of living a holy life, to specific areas of sin that we struggle with. If you remember last week in verses 17 through 19, uh, we looked at Paul's appeal to us to no longer live as unbelievers, that is to no longer live as we did before we came to Christ. <clears throat> but Paul says to live as Christ teaches us, in contrast to live as Christ teaches us, which is living a life of righteousness and holiness. And that's what we're going to look at in verses 20 through 24 today. Basically, so far, what we've seen in uh, verses 7 through 19 is because we've been freed from a life of sin, flee from a life of sin. And so the crucial question for all of us today is, how do we do that? How do we flee from a life of sin and live a life of holiness? I frequently talk to people when they're asking about struggles with sin. Is that They'll tell me, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying, but I just can't do it. And I think that is part of the problem for us. We think that we can try harder and harder and harder, and the more... Harder, the harder we try, the more we can overcome our sin. But that's not the way that the gospel describes the transformation of life that God requires of us and God promises us. When my kids were young, when we actually when we built our house, we built the house so that we would have a uh, a sink in our garage because we live on a couple of acres and there's a creek right behind us. And my father-in-law had the wise uh, foresight to say, hey, if the kids are going to be uh, playing in that creek, they're going to come in and they're going to be all muddy. And it would be a great idea to have a, a bathroom in the garage, which he did, uh, so he could clean up before he came in the house. And so one of the rules that we had at our house was that If you had been playing out in the field, if you have been playing out in the creek or out in the woods, you had to do two things. If your clothes were all muddy and you were all muddy, you had to wash your hands and you had to change your clothes before you came in. If you did not change your clothes before you came in, we stopped you in your tracks. You had to go back outside or into the garage and wash up and change your clothes. Well, 
Paul today gives us a metaphor of the Christian life of changing our clothes, of putting off an old set of clothes and putting on a new set of clothes, or putting off the old man or the old self and putting on the new man and the new self. And that's what we want to look at today in the sermon that I've entitled, Making Changes, Making Changes. Changes And the, one of the ways that brings about change in our lives is what Paul has to say here is to putting off the old self and putting on the new self. One of the things I, I just want to say before we get started is when I talk to people about change, we're all looking for a silver bullet. We're all looking for that, that one key. What's the one thing that I need to do to change? Or what's the one thing that I can do to change? And unfortunately, preachers, teachers, books often propagate that falsehood that there's just one thing that I can do that will take care of my problems, that will take care of my sin problems, and it's not that simple. There, there, are, there are, well, if I can use the same metaphor, there are many bullets that we can use that the Bible provides for us, or many tools in our tool belt. If I was a contractor and I was on a job and I had a tool belt, there are many tools that I can bring out that help me in my growth and holiness, that help me in my growth and change. And so there's not just one silver bullet, there's not just one key, there's not just one answer to the Christian life. Uh, but today, Paul gives us one answer to the Christian life. And we're going to look at that in Ephesians chapter 2, or I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 20 through 24. So let's uh, read scripture today in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 20 through 24. Ephesians 4, 20 through 24. But that is not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Okay, thank you, Colton Johnson, for that reading of Scripture. Two points today in our passage, uh, verses 20 through 24, is the first point that I want to bring across is Paul describes the school of discipleship in verses 20 through 21, the school of discipleship in verses 20 and 21, and the second point that he brings out is the curriculum of discipleship, the curriculum of discipleship in verses 22 through 24. So let's pray. Father, I just thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that you have secured your word for us today. Not that it would just inform, not that it would just give us more information and more knowledge, but that it would bring transformation. And so, Lord, I ask that through the gift of teaching and preaching, that your word would wash over us and bring cleansing and purifying and renewing of our minds and our hearts so that we would walk in newness of life. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's look at that first point that Paul brings up, uh, the imagery of the school of discipleship. And in verses 20 and 21, he describes the school as we having learned Christ having heard him and were taught in him. Three phrases that I want to look at briefly, uh, and then we'll move on. But first phrase is, is learn Christ. Well, what does it mean to learn Christ? Learning Christ means to be shaped by Jesus' teaching as his follower. Being shaped by his teaching as his follower, as one of his disciples. And if you look through the Gospels, you notice and you see that as the disciples grew in their following of Jesus, the longer they followed him, the more they grew in their knowledge of him, their love for him, and their commitment to him. And you see that commitment grows as their knowledge of who he was and his teaching grew. And that's what he's talking about here, is that, that learning Christ, that, that we, as we give ourselves to his teaching, he shapes us and he shapes our lives. And second of all, we heard him. That is, we heard his voice in the gospel. Whether someone shared us the gospel or we sat under some preaching and we heard the gospel. And what he's talking about there is that when, when we hear the gospel and we 
make a profession of faith is because we have heard the voice of Christ in the gospel in this way, is that God has so made the gospel true and real to us that we responded in repentance and faith and believed him. Maybe you can relate to my experience. I remember, you know, I was, wasn't raised, I was raised in a religious home, but I was raised in a home where the gospel wasn't clearly communicated. And then I had some friends who were Christians that shared the gospel with me. And I remember them sharing the gospel with me. And it was almost like it, 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 it hit a Teflon heart. And it just kind of bounced off. I heard it. I knew it. I understood the essential uh, facts of the gospel. But, it, but there was, I wasn't compelled to respond. There was nothing that motivated me to respond. And I remember you know, having different people at different times in my life. And then... I remember the time when I was uh, 22 years old and I heard the gospel again. It wasn't new information. It wasn't new content. But for some reason, the gospel had meaning to me. The truth rung in my heart. And I, had, I could do nothing but repent and believe in the gospel. And that's what he's talking about is that we heard the voice of Christ in the gospel and then the third phrase that Paul uses is that we are taught in him. And that taught in him refers to the ongoing learning from Christ as we submit ourselves to his teaching. As we submit ourselves to his teaching. The last words that Jesus gave his disciples was the Great Commission. Which part of it says is, uh, Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them, to obey everything I've commanded you. And the goal of discipleship is not just to know more information of Jesus, about Jesus, is not just to develop our relationship with Jesus, but ultimately our knowledge and our relationship with Jesus should lead to us becoming more and more obedient to Jesus. So then Paul goes on, to explain the curriculum of discipleship in verses 22 through 24. And this is what Christ taught to describe what it means to follow him or what the Christian life is all about. And I've been talking to different families during the quarantining. And one of the themes that I hear over and over from the mothers particularly particularly those who are working and still having to parent, and now they have the added responsibility of homeschooling. So they're working, These, particularly the two or three individuals that I've talked to, they're working full-time. They still have the responsibilities as being the mother of the, child, the children, and now they have a third responsibility of homeschooling their children as they help them get through school because they're no longer going to school. They may be video or they may be going to school online, but they're talking about the exhaustion and the energy and the requirement of homeschooling and the requirement that's that the added weight of the children because they're having to learn. My whole point of that is that learning is an arduous process. Learning is a hard process. Learning, even if you love something, learning requires commitment to what you're learning. And that's what Paul is talking about here in the curriculum of discipleship. He describes the change in the Christian life or change in the Christian life of the metaphor of changing our clothes. And as you heard in my opening illustration of that I used, we used to require our children to change their clothes and take off their dirty clothes and put on new clothes when they came in the house. And Paul is describing the Christian life in that way too. And another great metaphor is, uh, the, or illustration is when I was a kid, we used to, my mom used to refurnish, or, uh, uh, refurbish furniture. And what she would do is find either a piece of furniture that we had or she would find a piece of furniture at a garage sale or a secondhand store and she would strip it down and take off all the old finish and then she would refinish it. And my mom's house was, uh, the house was built in the 20s and so she wanted to have uh, all of the stuff, all of her furniture to be antique -y. And so she would an antique, put an antique type finish 
on the furniture. But what she had to do was to remove the old finish to put a new finish on the furniture. And that's what Paul is talking here, is that we need to put off the old self before we can put on the new self. And so what Paul is saying is that, we, that when we are taught in Christ, we're taught to put off the old self and to put on the new self. In some translations they have put on the new person or put on the new man or put off the old self or put off the old person or put off the old man. Now, all of them are, are fine translations. The ESV says to put off the old self. Well, what is the old self and what is the new self? We get an idea of what the old self is from verse 25 um, of chapter 4 when Paul says this, Therefore... Having put away falsehood, this describes the old self, put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with your neighbor. And that's the new self. The old self is the falsehood, that's which described your old life. And to put on the new self, which is speaking the truth, which describes your life in Christ. And so the old self are those sinful behaviors that characterized our life before Christ. The old self are those thought patterns, those attitudes, the desires and the behaviors that we had that characterized our life before we came to Christ. And these, these things that characterize our old life could be as simple as, let's just say, thought patterns. I was talking the other day to an individual uh, and, and talking to them just about some of the struggles that they were having. And they were talking about just the struggle that they're having parenting. Because they were never parented. Their, their parents weren't present, particularly the father. And so they didn't know how to relate to the kids. They, 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 it was almost, uh, which is pretty common, is they, they would tell them what to do and what not to do. And they, would be a, they, were, they were trying to be a good disciplinarian. But they didn't have any relationship. They didn't have any activities. They weren't pursuing their kid as a father pursues their child. And I said, you can be... You can be the greatest spiritual leader in the house, and you can push the Bible down them, and you can you can have great devotional life. But if you're not pursuing your children, not spending time with them, not having fun with them, not taking them out, and just doing stuff with them, particularly because you're quarantining and you have plenty of time now, they're not going to embrace the gospel because what you're saying and what you're doing is inconsistent. And they may understand religion and Christianity, but they're not going to get the relationship because you are the number one influence in their lives. And how they see God their father is how, I'm sorry, how they see you is how they're going to see God their father. It could be other thought patterns that we have. One thing that I hear about, I hear all the time is that God wants me to be happy. We never find in the Bible that God wants me to be happy from my circumstances. It could be attitudes that we have that were before Christ. It could be the attitude that we have towards other people. It could be the attitude that men have towards women, or actually women have towards men. It could be the attitude or the prejudices that we have towards different races or different demographics, rather than seeing people as created in the image of God. It could be desires. It could be skewed sexual desires that are warped and twisted because of sin. It could just be greed. And then there's a, a multitude or plethora of behaviors that characterize the old self that we struggle with or may struggle with, like lying, gossip, gossip, or just what I see all over the place, even within the Christian circles, is just being mean. Being mean towards people that you disagree with. Well, in contrast to the old self, Paul describes the new self. And the new self are those new thought patterns, attitudes, desires, behaviors that Jesus commands us to have and Jesus demands that we have. And when Paul says to put off the old self and to put on the new self, he's not just talking about self-help. He's not just talking about working harder to be a better person. So let's look at how Paul compares and he contrasts the old self and the new self in verses 20 through, 22 and 24. 22 and 24 are, are kind of parallel verses that describe the old self and describes the new self. 
And they contrast the old self to the new self. And so in verse 22, we see the old self. And in 24, we see the new self. And 22, we see, describe the old self as that, that which corresponds to the former way of life. And in contrast, the new self is that which corresponds to God. The old self is corrupted through desires. And the new self is created in righteousness and holiness. And then last, the old self is based upon deceit or deceitful desires. And the new self is based upon the truth. One of the things that I noticed late in the study of this passage was the language and how Paul describes the old self and the new self and the modifiers that he puts around them. Listen to how he describes the old self and the new self. He says to put off your old self. That is, that is who you were. That belonged to the former manner of life. And then he describes the new self this way. He says, put on the new self. Not your new self, but the new self that is created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. The new self is created by God. That is, salvation or new birth is God creating a new person, a new creation, with a new nature. And along with that new nature comes new thought patterns, new attitudes, new desires, and new behaviors that Paul describes as righteousness, and holiness after the likeness of God. So here's the deal. We're commanded to change, yet this change is created by God. You don't change yourself. I don't change myself. God creates that change within us. Look at uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship. That is, in Christ, we are God's workmanship. We're not the, we're not the product of our own workmanship, but we are his workmanship, workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It says we are his workmanship, created. We are a creation of God as Christians. The new birth is the work of God, it's not the work of man. It's not the work of humanity, but it's the work of God. So how does God create this new self that we're commanded to be? Or how are we to live the Christian life? How do you put on the new self when all of our thoughts and our desires are dominated by the old self? I don't know if you get up days or you feel days that... That your, your thoughts and your desires and your attitudes and even your actions are dominated by the old self. Dominated by the old way. And you are frustrated and you're discouraged because you feel like, where is this new life that I'm promised? How do we think in ways that... God is the creator of our thoughts. How do we have attitudes so that those attitudes demonstrate that they are created by God? How do we desire in such a way that God is the creator of those desires? And then how do we act or behave in ways that demonstrate that those actions or those behaviors are created by God? That is, how do you put on the new self that is created by God and not by us? How do you put on the new self, or how you put on the new self, is a critical question for you and I to know as Christians. It's basically, it's the essence of how do we live the Christian life? How do we live a transformed life? Now the Bible gives many ways, but Paul is talking about one specific way today. How are you to know how to follow Christ? 
And again, this is just one way. To, uh, as I said earlier, it's like a tool belt that God gives us on how we grow and how we become like Christ and how we walk in holiness. It's like a tool belt that he's given us. And we have all these different tools. And this is just one tool that we pull out of the tool belt to use to bring about transformation in our own lives. And so the answer Paul gives us and how to put off the old self and how to put on the new self is in verse 23. It's, it's like a sandwich where one piece of bread is the old self and the other piece of bread is the new self. And in between those two pieces of bread is the answer or the bridge. Is, and he says to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. The way that we put on the new self is by means of being renewed in the spirit of our minds. That's the bridge that gaps between the old self and the new self. As I said earlier, we have a creek in the back of the house, uh, back of our house. Karen was actually out there this week, this, this, this last week, and redirecting it away from the house because it has a tendency to cut in. And so she was chipping away at the, uh, at the ice and cutting away at the bank so that the uh, direction or the flow would be away from the house rather than coming towards the house. And years ago, we found a, 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 a walkway, and we put that walkway across that creek so we could get from one piece of, one section of our property to the other section of the property so we wouldn't have to walk through the creek. And that bridge is what fills the gap between one part of our property and the other part of our property. And in the same way, having our minds renewed by the having the having the having having the spirit of our minds renewed is the bridge of the gap between putting off the old self and putting on the new self. It's the way or the means by which we put on the new self. So our ability to put off the old self and to put on the new self doesn't just happen mysteriously. It doesn't just happen mystically. It doesn't just happen like I said mysteriously or mystically, it happens because it's a work of God creating the new self by, by us doing the work of placing ourselves in the place where God can renew our minds or renew the spirit of our minds. And I, I understand the spirit of our minds is this. That God re renews our minds by his spirit. That the spirit is the agent or the one who does the renewing of our minds. So God creates the new self in true righteousness and holiness. Or we could say that God creates the new self by the truth of his word. If you heard my word of encouragement video today, either on Slack or Facebook, you'll know that I used Romans 12, 2, uh, and encouraged us not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And when we do that action, Paul promises that we'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. That is, we'll just not know what God's will is, but we will desire to do God's will. And I said that, read a statistic that seven, that the average person who is quarantined is spending seven hours a day in front of some form of media. Seven hours a day they are listening to media, and probably most people in this world are producing media that has been produced by this world, so it is influenced by the spirit of this world. It is influenced by this age, this fallen age that is corrupted, and so the, the, the ideologies and the worldview and the narrative that that media is, is, is shaping the minds over seven hours a day. And so their minds are being conformed to and reinforced to the spirit of this age. Well, Paul says, do not be conformed to this age or this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's a parallel passage to what we're talking about today. 
And when our minds are renewed, Paul says the result will be is that we'll be able to test and approve. That is, we'll be able to know it, but we'll also have desires that are consistent with our knowing so that we'll move towards what is the right and what is the will of God. So God, by the renewing of our mind, God creates new thought patterns, new attitudes, new desires, and new behaviors as we put ourselves before truth, as we allow ourselves to be saturated by truth, as we, as we come under the truth. So we become renewed in the spirits of our, in the spirit of our minds by engaging with this book. By engaging with this book, not to not when I say engage, I'm not talking about just about reading. I'm talking about thinking and reflecting and engaging with this book in the same way that you would engage with another person. So as you're reading, you're engaging with this book. As the voice of God. So you're hearing the voice of God through the words of this book. And we're filling our minds with the truth. We're seeing the beauty of the truth. Or, and or we're, we're reading books that are saturated with the truth. Please, please do not fill your mind in this time of quarantine with media and entertainment because you're bored. Fight against that boredom. Push yourself against that boredom. And spend time milking this time by reading the Word so that your mind will become renewed. And as your mind is renewed, your thought patterns become renewed. And your attitudes become renewed. And your desires become renewed. And as your desires become renewed, your will is freed up to obey God so you have new behaviors that are consistent with Scripture. Let me just read a couple of other Scriptures that basically say the same thing in different ways. I want to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. And if you've been around CCC for a while, you know this, this is one of my favorite verses favorite sections of scripture because it, it talks to this very issue. Chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. So do not lose heart. That is, do not discourage. Do not walk in unbelief. Do not lose faith. Though your outer nature is wasting away, your inner nature, you could say that your new self, is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look, not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Paul is saying is when we focus on eternal truth and eternal realities, it is what renews us internally and spiritually. That although our physical body is wasting away, our spiritual man, the new self is being strengthened and being renewed and being vivified with spiritual power and spiritual potency. So that we can walk in newness of life. So that we can put off the old self and put on the new self. Actually, that's the only one that we'll go to today. The way you think. The way you think affects how you feel. And how you feel ultimately determines how you act and how you live. <clears throat> Next week we're, is our drive-in church. We're going to do drive-in church, and so I encourage you to come, sit in your car, and listen to me uh, preach, and we'll have worship, and we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. 
I've got a way, way that I think that's going to work for that, that we can practice social distancing and celebrate the Lord's Supper together. I don't know about you, but I have actually missed celebrating the Lord's Supper with my spiritual family. But the, but the time we did it before, <clears throat> I got up and I felt like, even though I was might, I felt like I had to shout because there was all these people in cars and then the cars were back far enough that I felt like I had to shout as well as them being in, in the cars. And so I found myself shouting even though I was might and even though I was being projected into car radios. I didn't have to shout. I didn't have to scream. But because of what I saw and because of what I thought, I felt that my voice on a normal speaking level would be insufficient to communicate. So I compensated because of what I thought in the way I felt. And as a result, I was shouting when I did not need to shout. I even recognized it halfway through. And I was chuckling about it. But yet I continued to shout because I felt like I had to shoot, shout. <clears throat> well, you and I renew our minds by putting ourselves in front of truth. And as we put ourselves in front of truth, God does the creating through the renewing of our minds. And as our minds are renewed, new, God is creating this new self that is created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And now in the next few weeks, we're going to flesh that out as Paul gives specific examples of how to put off the old self and how to put on the new self in verses 25 through 32. And so let me encourage you. Just like we, I tell my kids or when they were at home, told my kids to put off the dirty clothes of laundry and to put on a new change of clothes because they're all dirty. Paul is telling us to put off the old way of life. That is, put off everything that would characterize your old life, the way you thought, your attitudes, your desires, and your actions. To put that off and to put on the new self, which is created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And the only way, the only way that you're going to be able to do that is by putting yourself before truth, putting yourself under truth, so that your mind is renewed. So engage with this book. Read this book. Listen to the book. Listen to good preaching. Read Bible-saturated books. In this time when you probably have more time to do it than you've ever had. And I guarantee you that you will have the power to put on the new self. You will have new thought patterns. You will have new attitudes. You will have new desires. And your behavior will come more in line with becoming more like Christ. Because He is creating a new self. A new person. Because you sought the renewal of your mind in and with the truth of the Word of God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this truth. And Lord, I pray that we as a people would be a people who put ourselves under your word, think about your word, feed on your word, live, eat, and breathe your word so that our minds will become renewed. And as our minds are renewed, you are creating a new people. Created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And now let me close with Psalm 67, verses 1 and 2. May God be gracious to us and bless us. And make his face shine upon us. With this purpose, that your way may be known on the earth, that is, God's ways may be known on the earth, 
and your saving power among the nations. God wants to work in us so that he can work through us. And as he through, works through us, people will see our lives and they will say yes to Jesus because they see the power of Jesus working in us. God bless you and have a great week.
keeper, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 That is who you are.